recorded and oh, Arif okay. is in the process of connecting it. Okay, yeah, it's live now. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, it's on. Um, who's in charge of uh, making people the co-host? Uh, Arif is the host. Okay. I guess everybody I in this room to... is co-host. Okay, I plan to join again so I can use Prezi oh, video sure. in a second. Okay, sure. Okay. Sure, sure. All right. I'm going to admit the participants right now. Will that be good? Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, as the session will start soon, please be informed to remain on the screen during the sessions. We have a few notes and we'd like your cooperation for today's sessions. Please uh, set your name into your real name, of course, with your affiliations and switch your device into a mute mode during the sessions. During the talks, we'd like to request your cooperations that please um, mute your device again and participants are encouraged to actively write questions in the chat box during the sessions. So this webinar uh, will be recorded by the committee. So we'd like to request your consent for the recording as part of the academic and nonprofit purposes. Would like to encourage you to spread the pipes for today's uh, sessions to your social media platforms by sharing pictures, posters, and links to your colleagues. In order to get e certificates, ladies and gentlemen, you need to fill out the exit ticket distributed by the committee nearly the end of the session in the chat box. So we are still in the global pandemic. Hopefully this is gonna be over soon. Okay, the hope is now imminent. The vaccination is running. Stay healthy and stay happy. Okay, good morning, selamat pagi Bapak Ibu. Thank you very much and welcome to the 18th edition of Virtual Talk Saturday to 27th of February 2021, managed by Binus University and Universitas Negeri Surabaya. Would like to say special welcome to our distinguished guests, um, Director of Relo, Bapak Brett Horn. Thank you very much, Pak Brett, for joining us this morning. Likes to thank you very much for Professor Thomas Rob uh, from Extensive Reading Foundation. Thank you, Pak Rob. Um, say hello. Uh, and also, um, thank you very much, Ibu Fenty, Chairman of Indonesian Extensive Reading Association. Thank you very much, Ibu Fenty, for making this event happen. I'd like to also thank you very much and welcome our keynote speakers for today's sessions. We have uh, Rachel Wang, English Language Fellow at the US Department of State of English language program. Thank you very much, Rachel, for joining us far from Indonesia. 
I think I think it's already late evening in America right now, Rachel. Yes, thank you very much, Rachel. And also, I'd like to thank you and welcome Ibu Tati Duria, PhD, lecturer of Faculty of Tarbiyah and Teacher Training, Uin Sari Vijayatullah, Jakarta. Thank you very much, Ibu Tati, for joining us this morning. Senior faculty members, Dean of Faculty of Humanities, Venus University, Ibu uh, Elisa Carolina Marion, and also Bapak Shafiul Anam, Vice Dean for Students and Alumni Affairs, Faculty of Languages and Arts, Universitas Negeri Surabaya. My name is Sukut Sueb, so on behalf of the committee, we'd like to extend our gratitude to welcome you virtually to join the virtual talks number 18. Remember, it's amazing number. So we've been going so far, it's been sessions. So hopefully that um, these sessions will keep running well for the next editions. So for today's edition, ladies and gentlemen, we are delighted to invite you audiences, students, teachers, scholars, researchers, and also extensive reading practitioners to broaden our understanding about the extensive reading and learner autonomy for pre-service teachers. So we are certain that our keynote speakers that we have today are going to share lots of new insights for us. Bapak-Ibu, so this forum is an integral part of extensive reading talk series. This talk is made possible through the collaboration between Indonesian Extensive Reading Association, English Department of Binus University, and also English Department of Universitas Negeri Surabaya. This, uh, this session is also supported by RILO US Embassy in Jakarta, Extensive Reading Foundations, and Indonesian Extensive Reading Associations. Would like to also thank you very much Kepada Bapak Irfan Rifai, PhD. Thank you very much, Pak Irfan, Head of English Department, Faculty of Humanities, Venus University. And of course, Ibu Pratiwi Etnani Tia, PhD, Head of English Department of UNESA. And special thanks, of course, Ibu, Sen, uh, Ibu Fenty Siragar, Chair of Indonesian Extensive Reading Associations, for initiating this great collaboration. Thank you very much. And uh, we are going to proceed to the next agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, to open our session this morning, we would like to invite um, Pa Rob to uh, provide the speech and welcoming remarks to our audiences this morning. Pa Rob, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Yes. Greetings from Japan. Uh, it's rather cold here, probably colder than where you are, I'm sure. Um, yes. I could repeat again all of the names that Guk Sue just said, but it would take a lot of time and you aren't going, and you will probably hear them from other people too. So thank you very much, especially um, the committee at UNESA and uh, Venus University for all their hard work, because I know it isn't easy to organize one of these sessions. Now, since I am chair of the Extensive Reading Foundation, I would like to just remind you about the Extensive Reading Foundation's uh, program, ERAL, uh, Extensive Reading Around the World. You can see um, our webpage there, erfoundation.org. And ERAL is online only, and the deadline for submissions is, is February 28th. Oh my God, that's tomorrow. So if you haven't put in your presentation yet, especially the plenary speakers and the committee members who I know have been doing extensive reading for a long time, you still have a chance to put it in. And of course, ERAL is virtual, but it's a preparation for next year's big World Congress in Georgia. And I hope all of you will be able to come to that and I can meet you all in person. So that's all I have to say today. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to hear what the presenters will be saying uh, during this session. Please unshare my screen. Oh, I can do it now. There we go. Thank you very much, pa Tom. I think I can't wait to see you in Jakarta next year. Hopefully the pandemic is over next year, pa Tom, for the uh, conference. Thank you. Um, for the next speech, I'm delighted to invite Ibu Dr. Elisa Carolina Marians, Dean of Faculty of Humanities, Venus University, 
to give remarks for today's event. Ibu Elisa. Ibu Elisa, you are still on mute. Yes, okay, thank you. Please. Sorry, I cannot <laughs> unmute myself. <laughs> okay. Uh, selamat pagi. Good morning, Bapak and Ibu. Uh, I'm very happy for this morning. I can meet and greet all of you, even though this uh, through this online platform. And today I would like to especially greet uh, Dr. Bradley Horn, the Acting Cultural Office, Affairs Officer and Regional English Language Office Director, respected Vice Dean for Student and Alumni Affairs of Arts and Letter Faculty, State University Surabaya, Mr. Syafi Anam, PhD, and Honorable Speakers, Ibu Tati L. Duria and Rachel S. Wang. I would like to thank the organizing team of AIRA, uh, Indonesia Extensive Reading Association, UNESA, and uh, Binus University, especially Ibu Venti as the president of AIRA, Ibu Pratiwi as the head of English department UNESA, as well as Thomas Rob, PhD, as the chairman of Extensive Reading Foundation on preparing this event. On behalf of Faculty of Humanities, Binus University, especially English Department, I would like to express my gratitude for the opportunity of host Virtual Talk 18 edition in collaboration with UNESA and AIRA. We hope that this event can be an in-depth discussion on extensive reading and learner autonomy for pre-service teachers with our respected speakers. I'm aware that the both, uh, the both extensive reading and learner autonomy are two prominent topics discussed not only among English language scholars, but also among scholars of various disciplines under the Faculty of Humanities. Through this forum, I hope we could all explore the issues revolving around extensive reading and learning autonomy. Thank you, and I wish you all a fruitful discussion for today. Thank you. Web, you're still muted. Okay, so thank you very much, Ibu Elisa. Dean of Faculty of Humanities, Binus University, to give uh, the welcome speech this morning. So uh, from Jakarta, let's move to Surabaya, listening to the from Vice Dean for Student and Alumni Affairs, Bapak Shafiul Anam, PhD. Pak uh, Shafi, okay. the thank screen you, is yours. Okay. Selamat pagi and very good morning to you all. Uh, I'm very happy to greet you all, especially the Dean of Faculty of Humanities, Binus University, Pak Brett, Pak Rob, the Putiwi, and all the, speak the speakers, who Tati, who Rachel, and also the head of the English department of Binus, and all the participants. Uh, on behalf of the Dean, I say big thanks to all the speakers for of this virtual talk to Tati Duria and to Rachel S. Wong for your ability to share the knowledge and experience. I'm also very grateful to the committee for organizing this, ev this event, both from English Department of UNESA and also Binus University. And I also will appreciate the participants for joining this program. Uh, to me, this topic is very, very interesting, the extensive reading and learning autonomy for preservers teacher, because these two topics, ER and also learner autonomy, has gained much attention, not only for researchers, but also teacher educator and also teacher. So both 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 topics are quite crucial and also will be beneficial for day service teacher especially. Yeah, because to my knowledge, teachers need to have such kind of knowledge too implement so that they can implement them when they become a teachers. Um, so 
uh, I believe that this program will be very useful in providing broader understanding and also new insight about ER and also little autonomy for place of teachers, teachers and also teachers and educators. So I do hope that all of you enjoy today's virtual talk and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Pak Shafi, Vice Dean for Student and Alumni Affairs, Faculty of Languages and Arts, Universitas Negeri Surabaya. And thank you very much for uh, Pinus University and Universitas Negeri Surabaya for the great collaborations. We can't be happier to see this kind of fruitful collaboration. Thank you very much. So for the opening remarks, I'm delighted to invite uh, Pa Bradley Horn, Director of Lilo, US Embassy in Jakarta, to give the opening remarks, and we'd like to request Pak Brett to officially open to the sessions. Pak Brett, please. Thank you, Pak Sueb. Um, so on behalf of the U.S. Embassy um, and the Regional English Language Office, it's a great honor to be speaking to all of you again. Um, it's wonderful to hear from Ibu Elisa on behalf of Binos University, uh, Pak Shafi, Great to see you again and wonderful. Thank you for greeting us from UNESA. Um, you, like Tom, I'm going to apologize for moving to, to being very informal very quickly, but you know, all of you are our friends. We, we are such close collaborators in terms of this extensive reading project, if you will, um, that I have to move to first names very quickly because we're a team um, and I greatly appreciate um, all of our friends at IERA and also Tom and, and the team from the Extensive Reading Foundation. Um, but I really feel that over the, the years that we've been collaborating, years, plural, that we've been collaborating, we've come to form a team. And I, I deeply appreciate um, being uh, part of this effort with you and and as part as the director of the regional English language office we are humbled to join you in this campaign now on previous virtual talks when I have uh, joined I've, I've used an artificial background of the U.S. Embassy which is a bit imposing but it's kind of the official backdrop that we tend to to use on these things we use our institutional backdrop but you'll see behind me today I've chosen uh, to use books and it, it, to be honest, I've egregiously stolen from a, uh, my backdrop from a website in the US um, that is promoting National Reading Month in the US. Uh, next month, March, is the birth, mar sorry, birth month of Theodore Geisel. And some of you may recognize that name, but some of you may, most of us know him better as Dr. Seuss. Let me see if I can line, oh, it's gonna be hard because I'm using a virtual background for you to see my book, but Dr. Seuss, who is of course, um, for those of you who are um, perhaps not aware, he was a children's author in the United States that many of us um, grew up reading as our first books. And um, I, I wanna read a quick, quote from Dr. Seuss, because I think it is particularly appropriate in the context of the pandemic. The quote is short. The more that you read, the more things you will know. The more that you learn, the more places you'll go. Now, of course, we've all been trapped, if you will, inside during uh, the pandemic situation due to social distancing and, and physical restrictions. And now that we're a year into this, it has been challenging for I think every individual, um, young and old alike. But those of us who are readers know that Dr. Seuss's uh, words are actually quite valid. Books have been able to transport us um, out of our, our, our rooms, our studies, our bedrooms, our homes, uh, to the rest of the world. And I think that's um, critical even within the context of Indonesia. In terms of trying to celebrate and capture the ethnic 
and linguistic diversity that exists, the ethno-linguistic diversity that exists across the archipelago. We can transport ourselves uh, from the tip of Sumatra all the way out to, uh, to Papua. And we need to hear those voices from across the archipelago. The, the important thing about the role of pre-service teachers, since this is the topic today, is that our teachers and our young teachers, the future generations of teachers, need to understand their role in promoting this, in promoting not only extensive reading, but extensive reading across the languages of the archipelago and, broader, and the broader world. Of course, we have extensive reading materials, children's reading materials in English. However, there is a relative paucity of relative, relative, relevant, sorry, children's materials and extensive reading materials in the languages of the archipelago. And I would say that that is a challenge for all of you as Indonesian ed educators, but also all of us from, from afar, from, from outside in trying to strengthen and maintain, maintain and strengthen the, the ethno-linguistic diversity of, of your great country. Um, and I think um, there will be some very relevant information shared today, not only about promoting um, extensive reading in English with our, our um, pre-service teachers, but also information that you can use as teacher educators to help your teachers, your pre-service teachers, your students understand that literacy supports reading in all languages and literacy can may, be made relative, relevant to all of the languages of the archipelago. So with that, I am very excited um, as I hope all of our participants and our panel members and our, our, our luminaries are to um, hear from our presenters today. So I would like to hereby officially open virtual talk number 18. Thank you very much, Pak Suheb. Thank you everyone else for joining us. And I'll turn it back over. Thank you very much, Pak Brett. It's always energetic this morning, thank you. I like your spirit to promote extensive reading and literacy, Pak Brett. So I agree with you that during this, pandemic, during this pandemic, that book is the most possible way to travel around the world during our, you know, the lockdown sessions or the social restrictions around the world. Thank you very much, Pak Brett, for the opening remarks this morning. So colleagues, faculty members, distinguished scholars, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to proceed to the main sessions. Uh, a few minutes uh, before we start our main sessions during the talks, ladies and gentlemen, you are encouraged to actively write questions and participate in discussions. So you can write your question in the chat box. Would like to also uh, encourage you to spread the positive vibes about this session through your social media platform. So everybody knows that we are here having a productive weekend this morning. And also in order to get e-certificates, you need to fill the exit ticket uh, distributed nearly at the end of the sessions in the chat box. All right, so in the main sessions, we are delighted to have two uh, prominent speakers in the area of extensive readings and education. The first uh, speakers, we have Rachel Wang, so she is an English language fellow at US Department of State. So and also is English language program. And for your information, uh, Rachel is also a virtual English language fellow, uh, posted virtually at UNESA since August 2020. Thank you very much, Rachel, for being uh, with us uh, during this uh, pandemic. Hopefully you are coming soon to Surabaya. And also thank you very much for the second speaker, Today's, uh, we have Ibu Tati Duria. She is a lecturer, a faculty of Tarbia and teacher training, Uwin Sari Vidayatullah, Jakarta. And also she is a member of Task Force for School Literacy Movement under the coordination of Ministry of Education and Culture. So thank you very much, Ibu Tati, for joining us this morning. So for this session, our colleague from English department, Binus University, Ibu Dr. Risa Simanjuntak, will be serving as the moderator um, during the main agenda. Ibu Tati, are you with us this morning? It's Risa, Pak Suet. 
Yeah, yes, sorry. So, Ibu Risa Simanjuta. Thank you very much, Ibu Risa. The screen is yours for the main session. Ibu Risa is still muted. Risa, still muted. Oh, okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants of this special event. Um, my name is Risa, and it's an honor for me to be your moderator. Thank you very much, Pak Soe, for that introduction. This virtual event is quite special because this is the first turning point or because this is one of the milestones in our virtual journey to really link ER with uh, learner autonomy. So in this particular topic, in this special topic, we would invite your active participants participations after the two presenters present their expertise and also experience. With us, the first speaker this morning is uh, Ms. Raj Rachel S. Wong, and allow me to read highlights of her bio. Um, she is originally from Madison, Wisconsin, and first became passionate about how people learn and teach languages while studying linguistic psychology and TESOL. And she also holds an MA in Applied Linguistics from Teachers College, Columbia University. Rachel has also taught with um, some students in Japan and adult learners in New York, universities in China and Indonesia. I understand that some of Rachel's students are here this morning. Shout out to Rachel's students. And um, she is currently teaching training workshops for over 2,000 teachers. Her interests include project-based learning, social emotional learning, and culturally relevant teaching. So without further ado, I will give the floor to Rachel and Rachel will have 30 minutes sharing this topic. The screen is yours, Rachel. Okay, thank you, Burisa, for introducing me. And thank you to everyone at Venus and UNESA for um, organizing this event and inviting me. So I'm going to try to share my screen now and see. Does this work? Can you see, like, can you not see my notes? We can, actually. You can see my notes. Okay, yeah. so then I should hold on. How about now? Yeah, we cannot. Yeah. Okay, great. Perfect. Okay. So welcome to uh, my talk. I'm going to talk about culture and community with student created um, picture books. So today's goals are to talk about why have students create picture books? How can we do it in person and virtually and share student projects? And I will also start my timer so that I don't go over time. Um, so as mentioned, I am a fellow in Indonesia. Um, I was in Manado for two years and, uh-oh, hold on, technical difficulties. Okay, there we go. So I was a fellow in Indonesia for in Manado from 2018 to 2020. Um, these are, this is me with my students at UNSAT, Sam Ratulangi University and with the books that they created. Um, here I am with the, uh, wait, hold on. I am having technical difficulties because it's 8 p.m. and that's when my computer decides to uh, stop showing everything. Okay. Hello. Can you all still see me? Because I can't see anyone now. Yes, yes, we can see you. Okay, all right, I'll just continue. Um, and if there's anything that you need to tell me, uh, I can't see your faces at all. So that's the only thing. Okay, so just keep that in mind. All right, so now I'm at the State University of Surabaya, UNESA, and I think some of my students are here, although I can't see the participants list, but hello to anyone in at UNESA or at UNSET. So a little bit about me, I'm from Madison, Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin is actually in US, America. 
So I'm not from China or Japan. I'm from America and just want you to know that Americans also look like me. There's a lot of different faces in America and uh, it's like Indonesia, very diverse. A lot of people from different places. So we have a lot of different place, uh, faces. Yes, it is cold in Wisconsin. There's a lot of snow here. Um, so I taught in uh, Japan, China, New York City, Manado, and virtually to Surabaya. So today's talk, uh, the theme is extensive reading and learner autonomy, right? So let's define what is learner autonomy first, okay? So learner autonomy is when learners have some independence and teachers give the learner some choices. So students can choose, for example, what they want to read about or write about, just like this person is able to choose what they want to buy in the store. So why have students create picture books? Um, it's one way that we can give students a lot of uh, independence or autonomy. So uh, here's an example from my class last semester. Students can share their culture, their personal individual personalities, their hobbies and what they like. And this is a great activity to do for a self introduction or get to know each other in the class. We can also share the culture of our community. So this uh, is about Karapan Sapi, which is bull racing in Madura, East Java, right? Okay. If you have seen, uh, if you have attended Karapan Sapi, you can tell us in the chat. Um, and books also bring us together as these two kids are reading a book together. And this is a book that my students wrote. So creating books in person. So uh, before the pandemic, I was able to do this project at INSAT with semester three students. Um, these are the books that they created. They were about different um, local cultures of Manado, like traditional food, like babi puta or babi guling, and holidays like pungichapan shukur, which is like a Thanksgiving um, type of holiday in Manado or North Sulawesi. Students also made the books in three different languages. So we have English, Indonesian, and Bahasa Manado or Manadonese. Um, and this book is about a student who is from Papua and he moves to Manado and there's some culture shock, but eventually he is able to um, make friends. So uh, we can um, let students share their books in English and this gives them the chance to practice reading aloud and sharing stories um, while also practicing their English skills. So here's my students sharing the books they read out loud. Um, so we also did some community outreach in fall of 2019 before everything happened. So we visited an elementary school and read the books that they wrote to each other. Um, students, uh, the kids get really excited if you can get them involved and read in a very interactive way, like ask like, where's, where's Leo? How many people there? Okay. Um, and also we played a dice game with them in Bahasa Manado where if they roll um, number three, then they have to ask question number three. And it's not a test, so there's no right or wrong answers. This helps students realize like reading is not a test, it's for fun, or it should be in some ways, at least in extensive reading, right? We also um, visited a local neighborhood, and here uh, the student is reading about Pungchapan something that the students are, the kids, the are 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 all familiar with. Um, and that she's also reading in Bahasa Manado. Um, we also gave students the copies of the books in black and white so that they could read it on their own. And it was a really fun event um, when we did a call and response where when the, uh, when the university students, the teachers, when they said, Babata Itu, and then students had to say, Asik. Okay, so that was fun, which means uh, reading is cool, or reading is fun, or reading is awesome. Um, I also brought the books that my students created to a teacher training workshop in Ternate. And first we had silent reading time where the teachers got to read what my students created. And then we had small group discussion and then student, uh, the teachers shared what they liked about the books. And they also got to learn a little bit about the um, 
culture of Monado as well. I also uh, used mini books virtually. So the pandemic happened, as you all know. In uh, March, I returned to Madison, my hometown. So it was very sad to leave Indonesia and I hope to be back someday. Um, and so we uh, adapted the project to be able to do it online through Zoom. And I partnered with a organization called Salute Samanga, which is a conservation organization, conservation NGO. And their goal is to educate the local community about protecting endangered animals, protecting the local animals. So for example, North Sulawesi has many endangered animals such as tarsier or tarsius in Indonesia. There's also babirusa or deer pig in English, which is a really great name for this animal. Um, and so here's an example of the student's book that they created about um, babirusa. So uh, the students wrote books about these different animals. And then the main character in this book is called Giselle. She's a babirusa with um, extra long tusks. Um, so then we read uh, them aloud in breakout rooms and shared them um, with our classmates as the final presentation part. So the results were that students all made these very small mini books like this size. I don't know if you can see my camera, this size. And um, yeah, we accomplished. So together we created 70 stories on 50 different species. Um, and most of them are, were about animals, including like couscous, tarsius, babirusa, anoa, these kind of animals. Okay, so students were able to learn about their local community uh, with the endangered species that are around them and also learn about the conservation NGOs and what they were doing to protect um, these species. So then this past fall at UNESA, I also used mini books virtually. So um, the example of Karapan Sapi, um, this was done on computer, but some students created with pencil and paper. So this one on the top left is about a, a farmer in East Java. And we also have about bakso, sharing about culture of the food of Indonesia, the culture of bakso. And also this semester, we're planning to um, create a library website of all of their books and YouTube videos as well with students reading the books in different languages. And maybe if it's possible to do some virtual community outreach and get um, some more ade ade to read these books and enjoy them in different languages, including Indonesian and Javanese and maybe hopefully Madhuris too. So um, I think this project seems a bit overwhelming, like how can we get students to do this? So there's a lot of different steps that we did. So first, it's important to have a lot of examples of children's books. So, and of course the teacher needs to model. So I read them out loud, um, first in person and then virtually over Zoom. And I also assigned uh, read alouds from YouTube. So YouTube videos of someone reading aloud English children's books as the homework. Um, I really like the channel where this uh, image is from, Storyline Online. And each step has a different language focus. So this part, we focused on speaking and listening and getting students to explain their opinion and uh, summarizing. So for example, my favorite part of this book is blah, 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 because, and I think the message of this story is this because this. And also summarizing, um, uh, there's a link here, someone wanted, but so then. It's a thing to summarize in one sentence. Um, okay, I'll answer questions later, okay. All right, so then we introduced students to the topic. So um, for local culture, we did some brainstorming um, in person. It was like mind mapping, writing it on the board. 
Uh, virtually, we've been brainstorming on Jamboard, which is like a Google whiteboard. Um, and then in this part, we focused on using transitions to write their story. So narrative writing, you need to use transitions like one day or the next day or suddenly or eventually, first, next, then, that kind of thing. And the skill we focused on was writing. We also created storyboards. So this is where we made a plan and we put the words and the drawings together. And if students aren't good at drawing, that's okay because I'm not either. And you can just draw um, stick figures or triangles or circles, basic shapes. We also did peer feedback. So we shared our story storyboards in small groups, um, in breakout rooms on Zoom. And then we gave each other feedback, positive and constructive, things that we liked and what we could improve. Um, students also practiced reading aloud. So in small groups, like in breakout rooms or like in this picture when it's in person. And we also practiced reading it out loud to the class. So there's a lot of practice um, built in and uh, this helps reinforce like pronunciation and helps um, them stress the keywords. It helps them read it interactively and it just makes reading fun and a social experience. So the language focus here is reading and speaking, um, stressing keywords, intonation, voices, sound effects, making reading fun in another way. And also tapping into Indonesia's um, oral traditions. Then the last step was to present the books to classmates. So um, first there was a more practice of reading out loud in small groups for practice before presenting to the class. But if the classes are too big, then we just um, presented them in breakout rooms. So why have students create picture books? So um, like our theme, it provides lots of learner autonomy, lots of choices. Students can choose what to write about, um, what local culture to include, um, and the message of their story and what they want to draw, everything about it. Um, they can share their culture, um, it builds community because we get to learn about each other. My students, um, even though a lot of them are from East Java, were able to learn about different cultures and different traditions even within East Java because the culture of Indonesia is so amazingly diverse. We also practiced integrated skills, as we mentioned, and it's easily adaptable. So you can do uh, you can have it be a one day activity. So I just did a workshop yesterday with semester six students, pre-service teachers, and we created books. It was, uh, I taught them how to make it during class. Uh, we gave five minutes to think of ideas, brainstorming, 15 minutes of work time and 15 minutes to share in breakout rooms. So that was able to be done in um, one and a half hour workshop session. Uh, I also like using it for longer projects, as mentioned. So this was their final project. It was uh, seven to nine pages. So it's still like mini book, not super long. It, it was the final project. We did it over six weeks and some wanted to use computer, some wanted to use pencil and paper. The nice thing about, uh, the nice thing about mini books is, I don't know if you can see my camera, but mini books can be created with just one piece of paper. Maybe if we have time in Q&A, I can talk about it more, but you only need one piece of A4 paper to create a mini book and then you get eight pages. Um, so I like uh, using mini books because it's low tech. Most people have paper. Um, you can also change the language focus. So for grammar, you could have students write different sentences like past tense. It could just be one sentence on each page. It doesn't have to be a story, right? You could practice um, I am or I like, like to be verb or like verb. Um, you can practice transition words for writing a narrative. You can practice different vocabulary. For example, if you want, uh, if you're teaching about a family, like mother, father, 
sister, brother, that kind of thing. You could have students make a mini book about their family and draw pictures. Um, and it could be very simple, like this is my mother. She is however many years old, things like that. Okay, and then you can also practice pronunciation in read aloud as well. So books bring us together uh, as we have seen. Uh, and I hope that this talk gives you some ideas on how to share culture and build community through having students create picture books. So my resources, I have some, I used some photos from Unsplash, which are for free. Uh, if you're, oh, I couldn't use my Prezi video, so never mind. Um, and then the mini book is, uh, there is a PDF of how to create it. And I can show you that after I stop sharing my screen. Um, I also have some additional resources. So I used a lot of examples from Let's Read Asia which has free books in English, Indonesian, and Javanese, and even Balinese, and, as well as other languages. Um, I also, oh, I just heard about another one called Literacy Cloud. There's also global storybooks that have different levels. Um, of course, Iera and uh, Basa Bali is on here. And Storyline Online is that YouTube channel that I really like to use things. Um, so I can talk about the mini book assembly after I stop sharing screen, but here's my contact information, my email and Instagram if you want to see uh, pictures of the work that I do with students and also want to shout out the IERA social media and Relo Archipelago is the account for things in my program, the English language programs um, and US Embassy Jakarta if you want more info from uh, the US, I believe. Okay, so I think I have some extra time, right? Yes, okay, great. So I can, hmm? You have about 12 more minutes. Okay, great. So I would like to show you all that the mini book is only one piece of A4 paper. Um, you can fold it in half, in half, and half again into eight pieces, okay? So it's eight parts here. And then you fold it in half. And then you uh, fold it in half this way, you cut it, okay? And then you would make it, you fold it over basically like this. The instructions are in the PowerPoint and I will include a link to the PowerPoint after the Q&A. Um, so that you can make a little book out of A4 paper, scissors, and then you just need pencil paper and colored markers. So this is a good activity for people to do at home um, because not everyone has access to the same resources, especially during pandemic. Um, so this is how you make the mini book. And then I just want to show an example of, so this is my, oh, I have to change the mirror, hold on. This is a mini book that I created to introduce myself to my students. Okay, I think that's good, right? Or no, is it still mirrored? That's okay, yes, good, okay, thanks. No, bad? Yeah, it's, it's the right way. My journey oh, okay, is okay, great. Yeah, yes, exactly. Okay, so this is a book that mini book that I created to introduce myself to my students. And I thought I didn't have time, but I actually think I do. So here, my journey so far. And you can see a ghost sign. So here I used it to introduce myself. So I grew up in Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin. Okay, do you remember where Wisconsin is? What country? You can type it in the chat. Okay, what do you see? Is Wisconsin, what do you think this is? Cheese, a piece of cheese. Yes, it is cheese, it's not pizza. It's cheese because Wisconsin is famous for cheese. And then I wrote that I studied linguistics, psychology and TESOL for undergrad. You can see languages, I tried to draw a brain. You can see my excellent drawing abilities. And I taught in uh, China, New York City and Indonesia. I met Butiwi at an extensive reading workshop. 
I moved to Madison because of the pandemic. Goodbye, Monado. Very sad. Hello, students from Monado. I see you. And then I started running and baking bread during quarantine. Excuse me, that's bread. Now I'm excited to meet UNESA students and lecturers. And that's me. Hello, Velf. Um, and I could change this to, hello, I'm excited to meet all of you at the virtual number 18 talk. So this is an example of uh, a mini book. And if you notice what kind of words are studied, taught, met, moved, started, what do those words have all, all have in common? Maybe you can type in the chat or tell me on mic. What kind of words are those? Started, moved. Yeah, they're all verbs and they're all in past tense. Thank you, Joko. Okay, so we have, um, we have sentences with past tense. So you could have students practice past tense. Uh, you could also have them practice pronunciation. For example, moved and started have different pronunciation of the ed ending, right? So there's a lot of ways we can integrate skills into a little mini book. Um, I also used them for the I am mini books, which here's an example. So I am, and we have the name. And we did like, we did a lot of things with it. Like I am Asian American, I'm a woman, a daughter, I'm an older sister, I'm a teacher, and we can decorate it. I'm strong, I'm athletic, I'm an introvert, I'm a good listener, my glasses wear, a plant mom, an English speaker. Okay, so this is a uh, one way to have your students introduce themselves to each other, get to know each other and build community. Okay, great. I think that's all so we can have extra time for questions. Uh, yes, so the idea is that you can do it in very simple ways, like for example, if your students only know how to say, um, I am, you could just practice that with nouns, and then you could practice with, with adjectives, okay? Um, so you can make it very simple, or you can make it more complicated with longer stories. You can also use it for teaching other languages, for example, if you want to teach Javanese, or you want to teach uh, other, okay, there's other questions. Um, okay, so posting read aloud books on YouTube, yes. So when my student in Monado, she contacted the publisher, the author to ask his permission if he could, um, if she was able to record the video um, and he gave his permission. So we contacted him by email, the author gave his permission and we, um, he said just like to not use it for profit and to include the publication information. So he was okay with that. Um, the reason why I like to use student created books is that uh, if students use their own images or co copyright free images, then we don't have that problem. So it's much easier for us to create read aloud videos of what students have created. Um, but I think that uh, for the most part, most authors are okay with uh, read aloud videos. And I think if it's not for profit, it's uh, probably okay, but I will have to check on that. All right. Um, thank you very much, Rachel, for a very interesting experience in using mini book to empower learners and reading. I have already seen a lot of questions coming in uh, from Zoom and also uh, from YouTube. So um, I, uh, I know that you have addressed the first question uh, that was from Ibu Antonina Suryantari, BB Ukadewe. And um, there is another question from Ibu Nida Husna from Uing Jakarta. Um, she asked whether mini book activity can be implemented in junior or senior high school. 
Yes, I think so. I think that you can adapt it for all levels and abilities of English. Um, I think that if you want to make it really, really simple, you don't even have to have sentences. You could just have vocabulary words on each page, or you could do alphabet. There's some alphabet books, like picture books, where it's like A is for alligator. So maybe you could try to do that with uh, things that students like, like F is for football, or S is for soccer, if you're teaching American English, um, things like that. I think you can adapt it for all levels. Yeah, well, this is very interesting that you said it is adaptable for all levels. So there is also another question in regards to that from Ibu Rahmawati Mamu. Uh, she's from Universitas Negeri Gorontalo and she asked how we could apply the mini book activities in university classrooms. Yeah, so I've been reading aloud pic uh, picture books to my students uh, over Zoom, to university students, and also to lectures as well at UNESA. And I think both groups enjoy it a lot. We're able to practice summarizing, like I mentioned, the one sentence summary. Um, if you Google subist, someone wanted but so then, you can summarize the plot of a story in one sentence. Um, we also practiced expressing our opinions and explaining. So for example, I think the message of this story is blah, 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 because blah, blah, blah. And that's really important to have students uh, think about their opinion of the book. Or I like, or my favorite part is this because, or my favorite character is this because. Um, so that's a good way to have uh, practice summarizing, practice explaining your opinion, expressing why. And you can also use it for pronunciation and reading aloud, you know, practicing keywords, stress, intonation, and also writing. Writing, it could be narratives, it could be writing, it could be grammar, like simple past tense. It could be vocabulary, um, also listening with the YouTube read alouds. If you assign the read uh, the homework is to uh, read the book, but through listening, then that practices listening skills. And of course, reading, reading for fun, if you provide uh, some opportunities for them. So Let's Read Asia, Literacy Cloud, those are some free sites where you can get PDFs in English or Indonesian um, for students to read for fun. And I think you can do that for university and so also for high school as well. Oh, sorry, Budisa. Very interesting. So fun is also one of the highlights. Yeah, fun is also uh, one of the highlights, not only the yes, language, exactly. but also the fun. Yeah. Yeah. There is a sense of reading means reading should be for fun. Right. So, uh, in regards to that, there is also one question. Um, it seems like many of the participants are really interested in um, looking at the designs for uh, different levels. So, this one comes from um, Ibu Ika Kusumawati. But Ibu Ika hasn't mentioned the affiliation, so um, Ibu Ika asked a similar question, uh, but he, uh, but this question is focused most early on the construction. The question is, uh, what is the most construction we have to think about? What is the construction that we have to think about when designing mini books activities? Um, yeah, I think the what language focus you want to have, if it's on alphabet, if it's on just learning vocabulary words, or if it's on practicing writing simple sentences, as I mentioned before. And you could also make it uh, easier for students um, to maybe focus more on drawing. For example, if I read a book out loud to students, 
and then I could have them draw a picture based on the story. So that's another way to give students um, autonomy, choose what they want to draw about. So if I read them a book about, um, about Babi Rusa named Giselle, and then afterwards, maybe they want to try to draw Babi Rusa, maybe they will try to draw something else, I don't know. Students are pretty creative. So I think that you could focus on different things, different creative challenges. You could have them uh, draw a picture, you could have them make a short poem. In our class, we made haiku poems, which mm -hmm. is only three lines, um, that kind of thing. There's also some poems, there's a poem called the cross stick where you only have, you could just use one word for each line. All right, so you could start with a um, language unit or a language skill, but again, the uh, highlight here is to give autonomy yeah, to the students, uh, Rachel. So um, one of the participants also asked more about that in details. This comes from Emmanuel, I believe it's a Bapak, yeah? Bapak Emmanuel J. Bung Yanan from Unsrat, uh, Samratulangi, Manado. Uh, would you like to address your question directly, Pak Emmanuel, to Miss Rachel? You could unmute, unmute yourself and address this question um, directly. <laughs> it's okay, Joko. I'll just read your question. So, um, oh, secret you know, <laughs> Uh, so, so yeah, Joko was one of my former students, he, one of the authors of Leo's First Day, one of the examples that I used before. Um, a great book, the one about the Papuan student moving to Manado. So a uh, secret ingredient in yeah. terms of becoming a great and benefic beneficial lecture. Um, I don't know mm -hmm. if there's any secret ingredients. I guess the thing that I learned that was the hardest to learn is that the teacher or the lecturer doesn't need to, like I don't need to have all the answers and I don't have to be the expert. So no one knows everything, right? And so when I realized that uh, it's okay if I don't know the answer, then, and to just, say that. So for example, if a student asks something and then I don't know, I'll be like, that's a great question. I can either say, oh, I'll check on that and get back to you tomorrow about it. I could do that. Or I could say like, oh, that's a great question. Why don't you like research it and tell us about it tomorrow? Which uh, allows the student to go and look for the answer themselves. So I think that if you think about teaching as instead of uh, it's not to give students the answers, it's to mm -hmm. help students find the answer or help them learn from each other, then it becomes a lot less stressful because it's not like we have to know everything all the time. I think the main goal is just to facilitate a comfortable environment for students to be able to practice speaking, uh, be able to make mistakes, so, you know, like not laughing at students if they get something wrong yeah. and encouraging people to help uh, help each other, right? That yeah. kind of thing. You know, you were in my class, you remember? Those kind of things. All right. so I guess that's yeah. actually yeah. the secret ingredient, I guess, yeah. yeah. Is that the secret ingredient? Bodhisa, what do you think? What's the secret ingredient? I like it. I like it when you said that as teachers, we do not all, always have to, to give the answer because our answers probably do not uh, correlate to what they are experiencing. So I really like the idea of you underlining some of the important fundamental pedagogical concepts. Yeah? Give the learners a value, trust them in their learning process, and finally collaborate with them throughout the process. That's, that's really yes yeah, exactly because you're you're mentioning process where it's like learning as a process instead of just the product yeah, so. yeah. Can exactly. I agree on that wow this is a very um insightful but also enthusiastic discussion since uh, many questions come after you answer uh, 
several of the first questions. This one is rather interesting. It comes from Ibu Christine uh, from Universitas Negeri Manado. Um, shout out to everyone in Manado. And um, her question is in regards to uh, doing peer feedback. Yeah, so probably this comes from the perspective of educators. Um, and she would like to have you elaborate more on uh, how to activate uh, peer feedback in this ER activity. Yeah, so usually when I teach peer feedback for all activities, not just extensive reading, um, we talk about feedback sandwich and there should be positive mm -hmm. feedback part and also constructive feedback. And constructive doesn't mean critical or criticism, critique. It's also it, constructive. Construct means to build, right? So we're trying to build each other up, okay? So to help each other improve. So positive feedback, I always, uh, I get my students to get in the habit of the first response is to be, thank you for sharing. Okay, and I try to use that on my students too, if they say something. And then I don't just say, oh, that's wrong because blah, 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 blah. I would say, oh, thank you for sharing, right? Like, so thank you for sharing and positive feedback. I liked what you liked about it. And then something that they could improve, like maybe you could. So I give the expressions on the board or on the screen. Like, thank you for sharing. I liked, maybe you could change this or it might be better to, or what if you, that, 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 okay? So giving students the expression and then, um, yeah, that kind of thing. Pure, positive and constructive and then also giving multiple chances. So one week we have breakout rooms with these people and then the next week with a different group. Yeah, that kind of thing. I see, so the experience, uh the role as a teacher, as uh, the person who received the feedbacks, but later on also they, they would, uh, in multiple experiences, uh, experience giving the feedbacks to their yeah. friends. I think it's important to teach students how to give feedback, especially how to give positive feedback, because I think that's not very common in a classroom sometimes. So it's important to encourage people to do that first because of course if you only hear what's wrong then it's not very encouraging and we want to have a encouraging environment right right yeah i agree there is one question that is really relevant to our situation at this moment it's dealing with the pandemic so how would we apply um, mini book activities in this time of pandemic yeah, I think uh, it could be applied in many different ways. For example, it could be used to share about students' experiences during pandemic, because I think students have different experiences during pandemic. Um, it could be used to share about, like I prefer to do personal things, but you could also report on, you know, tell the story of what happened in Indonesia or in the community or in the city. So I think you could have a lot of creative ideas. That. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking Azhar. in the chat. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah, the, the question comes from Pak Hanif Azar from UNESA, and he shares a bit about the context of students nowadays or young uh, people nowadays uh, more inclined into doing video games, TikTok, etc. Pak Hanif, maybe you can tell more of your stories. What happens in your experience? Uh, Risa, just just to inform you, Hanif is uh, still in uh, his second semester. Ah, He's my okay. student too. <laughs> you are a teacher, right? So uh, tell us your experience. Tell us what you feel. Thank you very much for that question. Silakan, Hanif. Your t the time is yours. Uh, am I audible? Hello, Hanif. Hi, Miss Rachel. Hi, Miss Risa. So. Uh, my question is about how do we reach out the audiences or how to how do we promote our video, for example, reading aloud our own our own book on YouTube or maybe Instagram so that children will be interested in reading it also. 
and encourage them to, you know, that kind of uh, interest in reading book because as you know, nowadays children are more likely into video games and um, TikTok and extra. So uh, based on my experience in my first semester reading a lot my book and uploading it on YouTube, but the audiences were all my classmates and my family so it is not that effective to reach the uh, main audiences which are children so could you please tell me how to promote our video well so that it will be sent to directly to the children out there thank you it's interesting that you asked that question honey because that's our project for the semester right so we're going to be working on creating library websites and YouTube videos and Instagram videos to share your books with um, people virtually, right? And how to promote that. I guess it seems like the best way to promote that is to use our connections that we already have. So I think I would ask that you think about um, the contacts that you have in your community, um, your former teachers, uh, you can have them use your books to teach English to students, right? So reaching out to people that you know, I think is the best way to promote something, right? Because like for this talk, I sent my, the poster to all my contacts in Manado and at UNESA. And so you can see there's lots of people from Manado here, right? Which is great. So I think it's the power of like word of mouth and community connections. So I think that's... Uh, I think that's the goal of our project too this semester as well. And I'm interested to see how you answer this question. All right, thank you very much, Rachel, for answering uh, all the questions. There are still more questions coming in. So we will see whether we will have time to address those questions later on. Thank you very much, Rachel. It was a very inspiring, encouraging, empowering experience that you shared with us this morning. Yes, thank you so much. I just wanna say shout out to all of my former students, my current students, people that I have met in person or virtually who have joined me today. Thank you so much for being here with me. And I'm so glad that we can still have this community even though it's online. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, ER enthusiasts, free serv uh, service teachers, students who are interested to be teachers, we will hear more experiences on how to connect ER with learners autonomy for our second expert this morning, Ibu Tati. Good morning to you, Ibu Tati. Good morning, Ibu Dr. Isa. How are you? I'm good, Ibu. Hope everything is well at your side. Thank you. Allow me to read the highlights of Ibu Tati's bio. Ibu Tati is a very experienced lecturer, uh, language instructor, and also researcher. Ibu Tati Lati Paduduria, also known as Ibu Tati Dewati, is a faculty member at Universitas Ilmu Tarbiyah dan Keguruan, Universitas Islam Negeri for Uyen Sharif Hidayatullah, Jakarta, Indonesia. She was a Fulbright recipient for a master's degree at Teachers College, Columbia University, New York. So with a very good um, uh, knowledge that um, coincidentally the two speakers also graduated from the same college, Teachers College, Columbia University, New York. She has um, also continued her education from Ohio State University, Ohio, and received a degree of PhD in education. At the moment, Ibu Tati is an affiliated researcher to Jakarta-based Saiful Muyani Research and Consulting. There are plenty of publications that Ibu Tati has already shared with us. Let me highlight some of her publications uh, research publications and also her uh, opinions posted or published in the media. Among the selected publications is the manuscript entitled Evaluation Concept Literacy 
kurikulum 2011, part of rangka kurikulum 2011, which has been published by Pusat Kurikulum dan Perkumpulan from Kemendikbud RI. This will come out soon, ya, yeah, Ibu Tati. This is a very interesting um, uh, chapter or manuscript that you will be waiting for. Ibu Tati has also published a paper in type a very interesting one. If we don't include literature, where do we teach our students from? An effort to introduce children's literature to Indonesian student teachers, uh, published in Reading Horizons, a journal of literacy and language arts uh, from volume 58, um, edition three. Uh, you could check this out. Um, it has been published very recently in 2018. Uh, there are more uh, publications from Ibutati such as um, article Opini Harian Kompas just recently and the title is Pedagogi Untuk Menapis Informasi and then also Konsep Literasi Dalam Merdeka Belajar and is also an avid evaluator of the national curriculum mengevaluasi 2014. Ibu Tati has presented in multiple conferences and in 2020, she participated in a conference entitled Indonesia Focus Conference in Arsipa University of Pittsburgh, USA, and she brought the talk entitled Assessing Indonesia's Online Learning, Learning from Home Policy during COVID-19, a national survey. So without further ado, I will welcome Ibu Tati. Ibu Tati will have 30 minutes to deliver her talk and then continued by question and answer. Ibu Tati, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you, Ibu Risa. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Rachel, from the previous talk and all distinguished um, guests and all the participants. Um, um, uh, thank you for the very generous and very complete introduction. Um, but uh, I have prepared a slide that I'm going to share with you all. Um, okay, hopefully you'll be able to see my slide. Okay, I'm going to um, have a full screen. All right, um, my uh, the, the presentation that I have prepared here, interestingly, having some similar connection or some similar issues that being uh, discussed uh, uh, by previous uh, speaker and also um, speaker, speakers and also um, at the beginning keynote speakers, yeah? Uh, issues about children's literature, children's about empowering readers and stuff. So I'm gonna perhaps um, sharing things that I've, that's been uh, a dear to my heart, that is children's literature and reader response and literacy. So without further ado, I would just, um, begin present, uh, presenting my, um, my slide. Uh, here is a brief um, information about me. I think Bu Risa has already done an excellent job. It's a bit embarrassing um, uh, to introduce me, but um, I'll, to give you some ideas about things that I would uh, discuss with you and, and share with you, um, I have three parts in my presentation. The first part is concerned with the background and also the theories that you know uh, the frame um, my presentation and my research. That is a uh, transaction of reading response, reader response theory, including the research. And the second part, I'm going to talk about making meaning with text. Yeah, um, this refers to my own research um, where the children's liter lit literature class as a venue to prepare student teachers who are both readers and literacy teachers. And finally. The last part, I'm gonna, there is a, a telling example in how I, we can benefit from you know, empowering students uh, when they are reading with text. Okay, I'm gonna read the background. Um, a literacy education revolves around developing one's ability to engage with written language. And this ability requires the development of foundational skill that is decoding and meaning making process. Um, Pushing students to read a large quantity of books is one goal in literacy education. Equally important is the teaching efforts to facilitate student engagement with text. Meaning making with text is an approach pioneered by Rosenblatt's uh, reader response theory. Uh, it encouraged first and foremost to prioritize readers' personal response in order to make meaning with text. And the connection to today's topic that is an extensive reading and learner autonomy, 
The term of reader engagement refers to an individual cognitive process in making meaning with text. And in doing that, it values reader's ownership in the process. Here is the framework. Um, I'm sure, um, hopefully I can just uh, 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 share it briefly because I believe this is the community of uh, uh, faculty of literature or letters or uh, the enthusiasm of children's literature. So this is not something new, hopefully. So I'm gonna share it with you a bit so give you some ideas or background uh, why this is important and what, where, what theory and research that we can refer to um, that anchor our um, uh, practice in the classroom. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with Louis Rosenblatt. Louis Rosenblatt, I would say, is the most influential theorist in reading uh, uh, reading uh, theory, that is transactional reader response. Her influence um, um, on classroom teaching, that is very obvious when um, the shifting from a more traditional um, approach of, you know, uh, teaching, children's uh, teaching literacy, uh, then, um, you know, when uh, Rosenblatt um, introduced the theory, it, it completely changed where people, you know, where teachers are more like um, honoring students' uh, voices. That's, that's a huge, uh, uh, that's a huge thing in, in literacy instruction. Um, what Ro Ro Louis Rosenblatt proposing actually our championing, nurturing readers' personal response to text enables a meaning making process. That's a, a, that's a huge thing in education. Um, you, are, you are referring to someone else's first personal response in order to, you know, to build their ability to make meaning and then comprehend and also taking part of you know, ownership in the process. Um, reader response theory, um, highlights that three aspects that's very prominent, that is a reader, text, and context. As you can see from the visualization here, um, these three triad, I would say, is text, reader. Text is what is being read, what, what is being read, and that reader is person engaged in reading. Uh, and of course, the context. Uh, context, it can, might refer to you know, the purpose or the context in which the, uh, the reading occurs. And then the transaction between the text and the reader or the reader to text and that happens in certain situation would create meaning. That's actually the core of reader response theory that there's a transaction, active transaction. Remember, this is not interaction. So transaction meaning that reader might influence the interpretation of the text and the text should be always where the reader you know, refers to, there should be evident in the text that, you know, uh, back up their uh, judgment or their interpretation. Um, and what kind of situation that, uh, that the reading, uh, the transaction occurs, uh, therefore they would result meaning, okay? Okay, I'll just go back a bit to the basic question, yeah? I know we are all in the business of children, our literature. We know it is important. This is our profession and stuff. But for general ideas, why do we need to uh, to um, why do we need to study literature in education at all? Okay, there are research, plenty of research that uh, support uh, the importance of teaching uh, a literature for the purpose of classroom teaching. Yeah, classroom teachers who center the instruction on literature will help students to feed the needs for story and to develop students' foundation for literacy. For example, there's a sense of a story then also growing or developing a, a reader's book orientation. That's beginning with uh, the inclusion of literature in education. Also, students' critical thinking can be nurtured through exposing them to a wide range of literature and through engaging them in literature discussion, that is reading responses. That, the one that we are talking about. So it is through children's literature that meaningful literacy teaching can be fostered. Okay. Next. Um, all right. Um, let's. Um, so let's hear what Risa says about reader read response in classroom application. I mentioned about the immense influence of uh, Rosenblatt's reader response theory in classroom teaching, but also there are plenty of research that back up uh, the how, why it is important why they feel like teachers are feeling uh, uh, gaining something from uh, um, uh, subscribing to teach uh, using reader response approach 
uh, one finding is um, how did the response create non-threatening environment? I'm, I heard that previously from Rachel's um, presentation about you know non-threatening environment implicitly um, and because the classroom not seeking any single interpretation of a text so there's no right and wrong answer you know when you begin the interpretation the 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 it's very important to emphasize that we are not seeking any single interpretation you are feel free to respond to the text that we are currently reading Right. Uh, that's the first step to honor student or to empower students' voices. The second one is there is a sense of spontaneity, you know, because there's no inhibited feeling. Um, they feel like they're having freedom just to respond. What is, you know, the first impression or the first, you know, what they think it is they they want to make sense out of the text. So it, there's a a feeling of unrestrained, yeah? And they feel like everyone has an opportunity or has a chance to just um, um, a response to, to the text. Um, and also being able to explore the identities in connection with text. This is very important, yeah? Uh, readers are engaged with the meaning-making process. For example, discussing their identity in comparison that with that of the characters depicted in a book. This is in fact, is like a body of knowledge about investigating readers, uh, personal connection, and then how they um, uh, discuss about their identity when they are transacting with text becoming a uh, growing number, not only growing and becoming a body of knowledge because it's, you know, revealing things about their identities, what sociocultural factors that influence their reading, why they interpret it, they, what they would interpret um, text in such a way, um, that, uh, that becoming a huge thing in reader response. And another thing that is important about why reader response um, is, is good in classroom teaching, uh, readers tend to collaborate with others and are more open to different opinions, you know, because everybody has a chance to express their opinion as long as they're, uh, you know, referring to the text, yeah, they're referring to the text, but also they have interpretation, not single, and we are not seeking any single interpretation. People like, you know, more like listening to what others would say instead of just focusing on some what so-called excellent readers or good readers. We, uh, this is just giving um, an, a floor more um, open, yeah, uh, the opportunity to uh, give a different opinion. And for researchers like us, it is the approach of reading response, it enable us to reveal what sources of reading interpretation, such as what kind of social, what sociocultural values subscribed by readers. As I mentioned earlier, you know, when you are um, enabling students to um, explore the identity in connection with the text, you will see a lot of, you know, layers of influences in their reading. What kind of values, whether or not it, it then, uh, um, has something to do with the economy or class or faith or gender, that's gonna be very, very interesting, you know, uh, to see how those influences um, uh, would be surprised by the by, by reader. Yeah, in what context they would uh, um, those um, influences would be most prominent. Okay, now let's talk about the teacher being the locus of control in the. Okay, hold on a second. Something really blocked my view. Uh, teaching teacher being the locus of control in daily literacy activities. Um, in, in research, teachers who are familiar with reading response, reading response theory and transactional reading are likely to invite students to give responses and to have discussion. Yeah. In a contrast, teachers who are not familiar with transactional reading tend to be more text centered. Yeah, there's two opposite. When you are more exposed, or you have some knowledge about reader response. Um, you are more open to have students to offer their uh, interpretation or their reading about the text. In contrast, when you are not familiar with this kind of approach, they tend to be uh, seeking of something you know more valued according to the book, or you know uh, has to be more traditional that books is um, is everything instead of see books and readers you know equally important in creating meaning. Uh, so. Teachers, as the most important reader in the class, a knowledgeable teacher will model for students what they should be doing with literature, both for pleasure and literacy purposes, yeah. So they enjoy reading, but also they know what to do with the with, uh, literature that they're reading. 
However, research also shows that we cannot simply assume that pre-service teachers want to be literature, literature teachers take any pleasure from reading. They are not good readers. Maybe this is something that we are we feel like you know sharing the same feeling. Uh, I'm a I'm a lecturer, and um, many participants here are also lecturer. And if you're a student, probably you share some feeling with your uh, peers. That not necessarily that we are in the business or we are in the profession of teachers. Sometimes we don't really enjoy reading. Uh, that's that's a uh, that's also a fact that uh, being acknowledged in the research. Um, so research review suggests a strong influence of literature courses, for instance, for example, introduction to children's literature in shaping teachers' literature knowledge and their teaching practices. Um, it is encouraged that teacher preparation programs should consider pre-service teacher both as readers and teachers. Yeah, that is their professional aspiration. Also influential in reader response is the social cultural factors of individual pre-service teachers. For example, their reading history, whether or not they were they grew up in household where uh, rich environment with rich literacy environment, or they have access to um, bookstore or public library. They also other other factors, social factors such as faith, whether or not faith also influenced the way they selected book or theme, and um, also in in the U.S. I believe Rachel would uh, uh, conf I'm sure they would confirm this that race an issue that is very strong in reader response. It is very influential in how you are reading a text. Okay, let's enter the second part that is making, many, making meaning with text, children's literature class as a venue to prepare student teachers who are both readers and literacy teachers. This is actually an image from my own classroom. Um, I, I was doing a read aloud. I was reading Ye Shen. It's one of the classic and uh, got awarded um, I believe it's called the Code Award that's for the picture book uh, award. Um, the, the Indonesian pre-service teachers are reader and uh, reader and future teacher. If you see the asterisk here, meaning that you have you can have full access of the full paper um, and the information will be uh, by the end of the, uh, in the conclusion of my presentation. So I'm a growing interest on literature uh, oriented literacy education, i.e. national literacy assessment or assessment competency minimum. There is concern of, over a near absence of systematic effort to introduce literature into the program content of teacher preparation programs in Indonesia. So in the context of this research was an introductory course of children's literature in undergraduate teacher education program, uh, English teaching program. They had no prior experience of engaging with children's book, both studying it or discussing it. There's two goals of the course. First, the first one was to introduce the Indonesian pre-service teachers to, under, to an understanding about why children's literature matters and to introduce the pre-service teachers to the many ways in which children's literature can be taught in classroom, that is children's literature pedagogy. So the primary data of this research is a written learning reflection and the recorded course session. Here are the findings. There are three major themes of the finding uh, for the course of the semester. One is being a reader, the second one is developing an understanding about literature, and the third one is teaching with literature. And, uh, the, the, and the each, ma uh, the each major theme, uh, they also, it also has a sub theme. For instance, under being a reader, there's reading purposes and preferences. Um, they're also concerned about critical reading. There's a, there's a, they feel like they're growing their critical thinking, you know, critical reading when they are you know, studying literature, they're getting more aware about text being presented, the illustration, what, this, what the illustration would symbolize or would uh, um, send the meaning yeah, to readers. The second, ma the second major theme is developing understanding about literature. This, this all the sub theme concerned with how they perceive literature. For, for instance, the perception on literature, at the beginning, it was like more like classical book, you know, like Shakespeare, they would refer a literature as something classical. I think I've heard that before mentioned somewhere at the beginning of this presentation of this, uh, the seminar that in Indonesian context, lit, uh, literature associated with something classical or canon books. And in my case, uh, it refers to Shakespearean or uh, 
canon books by Bala Pustaka. So uh, over the course of the semester after studying, you know, they feel like they broaden their understanding about uh, what what consider literature. They also begin to see um, um, children's literature because children's literature a lot of in children picture. Uh, the portion of children's literature is picture books. They're also becoming, uh, getting growing attention to the importance of visual literacy, that each uh, layers, each uh, um, design um, convey a message that also equally important with the text that are being presented on page. Um, their growing understanding about literature also uh, noticeable when they talk about the connection of literature with other art form, that is music, they also began to see that. It reminds me what um, uh, in the US, when I was doing some observation and doing some uh, uh, apprenticeship, uh, the classroom that fostered children's literature would be called uh, language arts, meaning that they have anything related to art will be, you know, uh, will be fostered in that classroom. So this kind of growing, uh, the understanding about literature that includes other form of art and music, connected to what I have experienced and noticed from the previous observation. Um, the last major theme is teaching with literature. They begin to see literature for learning. You know, they begin to see literature that initially it was like more classical. And then they see that uh, literature for learning, they see the potential of it, you know, for learning that you could learn a lot of, you know, things from uh, literature. And they begin to see because they are, be, they were being trained as an English teacher as a foreign language. Um, they begin to see how they would teach um, uh, uh, English as a foreign language using literature. Uh, and finally, they'll be growing their identity of becoming teachers of literature. So those are the findings, the major findings, including the sub-themes. We can discuss the findings. Obviously, we can see that the pre surface teachers posit positive attitudinal changes in terms of the reading habits and increased attention to critical reading. There's a sense of literature understanding broadened by uh, broadened from you know classical books like uh, Shakespeare or some canon books by Bala Pustaka to include visual literacy in picture book art and literature connection to music. They also discovered many opportunities for teaching using literature, including reading for enjoyment, literacy development, and teaching English as a foreign language, including classroom application. However, as a researcher, I noticed that the pre-service teacher's approach to literature is still predominantly with a mindset toward literature pedagogy and still less clear about their reading for pleasure. So that's something that still, you know, bug us, bug me in person. So the implication will be in teacher education, the premise is there are two identities that are intertwined, you know, in teacher education and literacy teacher, there should be these two identities should be hand in hand. That's be being a reader and being a literacy or literature teacher. Teacher education program should nurture student teachers who read well. They enjoy wide reading and possess the knowledge and skill to teach with literature. Uh, we learned from large scale research from the UK, there is a connection between the teacher's lack of literature knowledge and reading habits in their literacy teaching practice and choices of book, resulting in a poor quality of literacy instruction. If, uh, I think it is quite, you know, uh, uh, it's quite obvious if you don't really enjoy reading, meaning that you don't really uh, have, in, uh, have an interest to see what's, what's available, what good books available, so you can, you know, share with your own classroom. Otherwise, you just, you know, uh, by chance, instead of just sitting something that your personal interest, you are investing uh, as your personal interest. Okay, let's enter the part three. That is um, an example that I've been doing with my own uh, students um, uh, using an approach of reader response. So hopefully it will give you, you, know, you know, some ideas. Um, um, the example uh, from my own research that is pre-service teachers as readers, um, they are reading and responding to the librarian of Brasa. So I'm holding the book right now. I have the copy. Um, the, the librarian of Brasa was written and illustrated by Jeanette Winter. It tells a sto true story based on true story about, an, he, about a heroine named Alia Muhammad Baker, the ship uh, librarian in Basra, Iraq. Um, 
I, I think the setting occur uh, at the in in 2000 something during the Iraq War. So that's a. a uh, how um, the, the setting in which the story took place. Alias Great Courage helped to rescue almost the entire library collection, connect, uh, collection days before it was set on fire. Okay, let me show you where the story came from. The story came from this uh, publication from the New York Times. The New York Times in 2003 uh, published a report and profile uh, Aria Muhammad Baker about she was the ship and also um, was, you know, rescuing the library co co collection uh, 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 from the library that almost set on fire, you know, because of the, there's a war and the fighting between two um, armies, the, U the US, yeah, of course the US at that time, um, and the local army. Uh, so the casualties is uh, a library, a great library in Basra. Uh, it's been reported by the New York Times and it's in, inspired Jeanette Winter, uh, the, the, the author, to uh, write a story about her in a book called uh, The Librarian of Basra. So when I did uh, investigate, when I investigate uh, the students' responses to book, to the book, I found some major themes that are, for instance, they said, I love Alia, I cannot believe people would be willing to save books in a library when they are in danger, but Alia is different. She is a book lover, she loves books more than she loves herself. That's amazing. Okay, there, there is a positive uh, reading the uh, inclined toward the act, uh, the characters they are reflecting part of themselves. Uh, they use the book as a mirror. This is actually the terminology that coined by uh, um, children's literature um, scholar named Professor Judin Bishop, where in the mirror themselves in the text. You have a text and you see something about you on the text. So that's, that's why it's called a mirror. There's a reflection about you from reading the text. Um, let me read the quote from the participant. Honestly, I don't like to read books because I think reading books is a burden. I want to read a book for pleasure, but I kind of feel that way. I always carry a book with me for a course assignment, but I don't know how eager I am to read the book unless I have a deadline to finish it. But I really envy Alia. She regards books as her best friend. She carries them with her everywhere. There's, it changed my perspective about books. Books are important whether I like it or not. Books can be my best friend or my burden depending on my perspective about books themselves. Now I believe that loving book is the way to see the world. So uh, when they are doing the reflection, we can see there's a sh shifting attitude from previously more negative attitude toward reading. Now it's shifted to having positive attitude toward reading. I think it's a big deal for us, you know, uh, for a teacher, yeah, to see how the, 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 the shifting attitude from negative to more positive about reading. And another thing they have found from their response to the importance of the international uh, literature that is a story from a perspective that is different from the mainstream you know this is a story about librarian obasa setting in iraq you know the, the majority of the population was muslim so being muslim themselves many pre-service teachers felt personally connected to the positive description of a Muslim character and hoped others could take the good things from the book. As one quote said, this story was based on a true story. I found something new. Usually English is always related to the Western culture, but in this story, the author used Muslim as the story's main character and Basra a city in Iraq as the story setting. There is one also indicate they gain knowledge about what counts literature, yeah, uh, in this case, it's literature genre, you know, the free service teachers in this study gain a new knowledge about the literature genre, specifically about the genre of information on nonfiction picture book. 
One thing that made me surprised was that news can be used by a brilliant author as a story in a picture book. So they, it still, they didn't, it was inconceivable for them that the news uh, published by newspaper, it can be turned into a good children's literature. Um, uh, so this is something to so broaden the understanding what counts literature or what counts literature gender. And finally, uh, they begin to see the horizon of teaching with literature. They begin to see the uh, possibilities of teaching with using literature. They're, they said there's so much they could do with nonfiction picture books like Alia's story. I can learn about history and art. You know, um, I think uh, someone referred to this. You know, about book. You know, you can travel and stuff. I think at the beginning it was uh, Mr. Brad. I, I'm not really sure, but. Uh, indeed, in my finding, the response about, you know, they could do with nonfiction picture books, I can learn about history and art, even if I don't travel much through nonfiction picture books, I can learn about other countries. Yes, yeah. yeah, right on, right? So they also see or they begin to see how they are inspired by the story that, you know, inspired them to be something in the future. You know, the stories lesson inspire me to become a writer someday. This is... Um, uh, uh, mahal, yeah? how a story can really give someone an orientation in the future, some option in life. I think this is the value, one of the value meanings of uh, using children's literature in teaching. Yeah? Uh, so here are my concluding thoughts. Um, the literacy is a process that requires both constant and gradual and long view process. Children's literature is an aesthetic liter uh, literary object that potentially offers rich and meaningful literacy education. The potential can only be optimized when there is a deliberate effort to nurture students' ability to making meaning with text. For example, they are being actively engaged with reading text through read reader response approach. Considering the crucial role of having knowledgeable literacy or literature teachers, one pressing need is to design a solid teacher preparation and attempts to the intertwined identities of both being a reader and a teacher. Uh, here are the references. Uh, feel free if you want to check this out. And thank you. Here's my information. I think I'm going to turn it over to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibu Kati. That is a very liberating talk that you had just shared with us. I hope this will further encourage pre-service teachers to embark on their journey and uh, let and also the learners. We have already questions that is addressed to you. Uh, one question is from Ibu Martini. Uh, Ibu Martini is a teacher from SMAN 1 Sedayu Bantul uh, from where I was born, Yogyakarta, from DIA. Hello, Ibu Martini. Good morning, Ibu. Ibu Martini, would you like to address your question yourself to Ibu Tati? You can, you can unmute your microphone. Thank you. Can uh, you listen, uh, listen my voice? Yes, Ibu. Ibu, loud and clear. Okay. Thank you very much for the great opportunity. First of all, thank you very much for Miss Tati for the nice presentation. And uh, my question is about how to introduce uh, my uh, the student of senior high school about uh, reading literature because you know that in SME, the English, uh, we only have two hours in a week and we have a lot of materials that we should give to our students. So I think it's very hard for the teacher to introduce literature to my students. Thank you very much. Okay, the, the voice is a little bit breaking. Okay, I think that's all. Yeah, all right. Maybe um, but, uh, you can read the question from my live chat, yeah? Yeah. Maybe the, the my place is not so good. 
Allow me to repeat Ibu Martini's question so all the audience will hear it again. My question is how do we introduce reading English literature for senior high school students while they have lots of burden to learn other subjects at schools? Thank you very much. Okay, um, let me just uh, answer the question. Uh, terima kasih, Bu. Um, so to answer your question, my presentation actually focusing on um, how to integrate literature in your own teaching, regardless of the subject. Yeah. So you use literature as a source of teaching and a source for student to learn. Uh, instead of you know relying simply on textbook, we can use a number of literature that can be meaningfully integrated in your own teaching, regardless of the subject, the theme, a topic of discussion. There always be a way for you to integrate children's or literature in general. We call children's literature because we we wanna you know cover from the early childhood until at least a junior junior and from the junior and to senior typically they are considered adult adult readers so you read anything that your teacher would read uh, when you are in college you will read something that the senior high school would read that's typically where the children's literature would be situ situated yeah uh, um, so to answer ibu question sorry ibu uh, your name escaped me um martini Ibu Martini, yeah. uh, maybe to think about the opportunities to have uh, books other than textbooks in the subject they're being taught in your in your schools, and then to complement that, to ask teacher if Ibu Martini is the teacher, maybe Ibu Martini would consider uh, getting uh, having a collection in addition to the textbook that's similar in theme. What kind of theme there are? can be complemented using other uh, 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 text or reading that is available in the market. Why it's available in the market is important because typically when you are um, reading something that's non-textbook, it's, it's for the enjoyment of reading mm -hmm. instead of just textbook, you know, um, very dry, sometimes not interesting that you just want to learn something from it. But when you have plenty of uh, books that to be integrated in your teaching, it is more like creating a meaningful understanding about the topic that we are presenting. And in addition to that, you have, you know, growing the student's ha habit of reading. I think hopefully I would answer the question, Bu Martini. Thank you very much, Ibu Tati. Uh, I was quite interested when you said, let's move forward from uh, subject-oriented books. This, this is, there is a similar question uh, in regards to that from Ibu Ika Kusumawati. Ibu Ika has not mentioned the institution, but her question is very interesting. She asked uh, um, we could use audio book for students. And yeah, the concern is because um, literacy is sometimes difficult to be applied. So can we use audio book for students audio. to literary culture? Yeah. Do you have any experience on that? The audiobook, um, I would say, you know, audiobook is very good thing, but it wouldn't complement it. If you have the opportunity, um, use as many resources as possible, including something digital, something printed, something more tangible, something, you know, more accessible during the pandemic. Use that if you have the, the, those things, it will be excellent, including if you have an uh, audio book, because audio books, according to research, it has its a purposes, you know. Um, it, uh, I've read the research about audio books, it, enhancing your understanding or your um, something that you've read on a paper perhaps or something that you would need some more attention when you are reading a text you need more like focus lesser focus on something presented on the on, on a page but when you are reading an audio book this is like creating um, um, something more uh, enhancing what you have developed in, uh, in, the, in the for the purpose of teaching yeah for the purpose of teaching it is hence something that being uh, developed in a classroom or the instruction but if you are reading for pleasure audio audio book is uh, is to go i have my audio books i have you know um it is allow me when i'm i'm driving i'm you know i mm -hmm. can enjoy one book or chapter that's uh, that's uh, very possible when I mean, you are in jakarta indonesia you spend so much time on the road when it is normal so audio book, audio book is uh, uh, it, uh, is uh, I would say um, I would recommend that yeah for reading for pleasure. 
Thank you very much for that answer, Ibu Tati. I hope that uh, covers your um, question, uh, Bapak or Ibu uh, Karu Ika. Unless oh, I answer the question, Ibu Ika, I'm sorry if I didn't really satisfy your, uh, your question. The next question comes from Ibu Karunia, Unesa, and she, or oh, is it Bapa or Ibu? Apologies, because in Indonesia we have Bapa Karunia, Ibu Karunia. Yeah? Um, uh, the question was, how do you think general ER activities can promote literacy skills? And um, I think Ibu Tati has addressed a lot of this um, during the talks. Yeah, Ibu, maybe if you want to put certain highlights towards the general this general question. Actually, I, I missed the first part of your question because it broke out the voice. Would you please repeat, Ibu Risa, if you don't mind? Sure, sure don't mind. Uh, the question goes, how do you think ER can promote student literacy skills? Okay. Um, students' literacy skill. When you are doing an extensive reading, it is part of the goal is, you know, being literate. You know, you are reading a large quantity of books. Uh, it is very important. But being literate also means critical. Yeah, being literate means that you are being critical, you are consuming books, but, uh, that what you are consumed, you know what you are being consumed. What mm -hmm. kind of the author wants to tell you? what kind of um, styles that uh, the, the authors uh, is used when, uh, when she or he described that, you know? You use that kind of lens in your head when you are approaching a book. So you are indeed, it is recommended for you, highly recommended to consume a lot of books, but in addition to that, it is important that you are beginning to see uh, what books is being offered. It's not just for consumption. Book is also an idea for someone else. You have your own idea. So you need to confront that or to negotiate the meaning from the um, from the authors that the author being offered. The good thing about the extensive reading is because you read, you read a lot of books, meaning that you consume a lot of information in your head. So when you're approaching a new book, it is very possible that you have read that kind of theme in the past. So you know that the, you are inform the information that you are cons uh, you are, uh, you are consuming at that moment it is not something new. Perhaps you know this is it doesn't feel like right because there's information from the other book um, that also presented a different case, a different argument. What you are doing at that moment when you 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 have done a large quantity of book is that you are doing the intertextuality. Something that you read at the moment, you are referring to other sources of information that you have done in the past. This is not gonna happen if you don't read a large quantity of books. So that's where I think for, for me personally, uh, ER um, has a play a big role in promoting literacy. Thank you, Butate, for that. I hope this covers all the questions. Last question, Ibu. This is from Mas or Pak Joko from Bunsa. Again, yeah. This is a question about recipe. Do you have any recipe to increase readers? In increase readers, uh, readers' passion. Yeah. Um, I think Rachel or uh, some speakers uh, at the beginning of the seminar mentioned about it. Is it? We should start something with uh, books that the readers like. I always start with that. As silly as it is, as long as, as it is a, read, a book, you need to start with that and then build from the thing that the reader, reluctant readers pick and build from that, either from the theme or from the genre, yeah? Uh, in the format, perhaps, the beginning, they begin to see from the comic. I would, uh, uh, I would champion comic as one of the, you know, uh, sumber untuk belajar, yeah. So yeah. if they begin with comics, that's okay. Uh, it's also literature, yeah. It's a different genre in literature. So start with that, and then maybe see what that com what that particular comic offers, and then see what else you can recommend reading for further reading for that particular reader. So always begin with something that they like and build from that. Thank you very much, Ibu Tati. That is a very presentation about readers' response that uh, in 
uh, activate learners' autonomy. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants of this 18 virtual talk with a special topic on ER and learners' autonomy. We have come to the end of the two presenters' talks. Allow me to give some highlights. Uh, I think there is no um, a perfect summary for these two interesting topics because more, uh, the more we learn about their experiences, the more layers of knowledge that could be um, revealed. I would highlight what uh, Ms. Rachel S. Wong has already presented this morning by using mini books uh, activities, we start uh, providing uh, chance, allowing students to start their own reading journey, to start also to tap in on their cultural knowledge, to tap in on their cultural issues, to bring up to the reading uh, materials something that is related to them. So they're reading not other people's story, they're reading their own stories. I think. This is very, very empowering. Ibu Tati has mentioned also the perspective of the, I think this is a very empathetic perspective when we see reading literacy from the perspective of the readers by applying readers response activities. Ibu Tati underlined the importance of opening layers of identities of the readers by reading, by responding to, to the text and information they have provided from the text they selected or uh, introduced to them, they realize who they are, they realize what they have in their culture and other people have in the culture. They will embark not only in the journey of language learning, not in the um, semi-instructional culture, because literacy from your talk, Ibu, I just realized that um, uh, our, our learning path is always linked literacy with instruction. So both, both speakers have already uh, moved forward beyond that by saying that reading literacy needs always to be anchored to learners' identity, learners' passions, learners' um, what they like, or learners' interests. So without trying to summarize, I think, or most of you have also take back with you, take home with you some very important um, knowledge and insights which are relevant to your own situations and your passions, especially for pre-service teachers. And for those of you who are already in the service, it will further encourage you in guiding, working together, processing together, like Rachel has already highlighted toward the learning path. So, Thank you very much again to Ms. Rachel as well. Thank you, Rachel and Ibu Tati. Matur sakalangkong, matur nuon. Terima kasih banyak. Thank you. Um, I will give the screen back to Mr. MC, Pak Sueb. Thank you very much, um, Ibu Risa, for having led perfectly the talk this morning. So uh, we start holding Doctor on Applied Linguistics to Master on Applied Linguistics and Education Management, permanent lecturer at Binus University, really successfully provide a comprehensive summary for today's session. Thank you very much, Ibu Risa. So um, we'd like to, of course, thank you very much uh, to our speakers, Rachel and Ibu Tati for having shared a fruitful and very brilliant insights this morning. So. I'm sorry, my daughter is sitting beside me. <laughs> so, um, so professors, ladies and gentlemen, so we come up to the end of today's talk. We will see you again for the next virtual talk on extensive reading. For the next uh, virtual talk, it will be conducted uh, by Uin Hadan Intan Lampung. So we have Ibu Istikoma in this forum. Maybe Ibu Istikoma to give a word to the audience for the upcoming virtual talk. Number 19, Ibu Istikoma. Are you with us? Yes. Yes, please, Ibu. Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, our next uh, virtual talk to 19 will be held in March. It's about uh, in 16. 
uh, at 1 p.m. in Indonesian time, Jakarta time. And then uh, I would like to uh, welcome you and uh, invite you to join there uh, in Uwinda Den Intan Lampung in Sumatra. So see you, see you next month. Thank you, Pak. <laughs> Thank you, Ibu Istikama, for sharing the information for the upcoming virtual talk in Uwina dan Intan Lampung, and also for the upcoming virtual talk in April. It will be hosted by UKSW, Satya Wacana Salatiga, and University of Mulia Kudus, uh, Central Java. So anyway, while we are waiting for some participants to check the link for the attendance list and the exit ticket, please find the link for the exit tickets in the chat box in order to get and the access for your certificate for today's event. So please be informed again that you are required to fill the exit ticket to get uh, to get the e certificate. Okay, so you will have for about 60 minutes starting from now for uh, finishing the exit ticket and to get the e certificates. So please refer to chat box before leaving this room. All right, that is in German. So we we come to the end of our session this morning. Allow me again to extend our appreciation to the audience and also special thanks to Pak Brett and Budian from Rilo, US Embassy, Jakarta. Terima kasih. Thank you very much. Pak Thomas, thank you very much um, from Extensive Reading Foundation in Japan. Pak Thomas, thank you. Ibu Fenty Siregar and friends from Indonesian Extensive Reading Association. Thank you very much. And also thank you very much for two leaders of the respective English departments from BINUS and UNESA, Pa Irfan Rifai, PhD, and Ibu Ratiwi Erdaningcia, PhD. Thank you very much for the great collaborations, uh, Pa Irfan and Bu Ratiwi. And uh, the organizing committee, thank you very much. And last but not least, our speakers, Rachel and Ibu Tati, for great insights this morning. Thank you very much, bye bye, Ibu, and see you again to the next three twelve talks. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you, thank you. Healthy, thank you, thank you, Pak Brad. Thank you, Pak Tom. Thank you, Tiwi. Thank you. 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 Thank